Okay, well, welcome to Roots of Reality Experiences. Today I'm joined by Chad Wolf, who is the lead singer and co-founder of the rock band Carolina Liar, best known for the hit song, Show Me What I'm Looking For, which was certified gold by the Recording Industry Association of America and featured in the Billboard Top 100. Additionally, Chad is also the lead singer and co-founder of the rock band, The Federal Empire. And lastly, his music has had millions of online streams and been featured in various films, TV shows, and video games. So Chad, thanks for coming on. Dude, Ben, thanks for having me, man. I can't wait to see what we get into today. Yeah. So. yeah. Absolutely. Kind of sounds like it's going to be an adventure. That's right. It's going to be a real roller coaster here. So get ready. Yeah. Right on, dude. I'm in it. <laughs> so, just starting off, uh, when did you first get interested in music in general? Dude, it, uh, music started, <clears throat> it's a family thing. We grew up in Pentecostal holiness churches, and uh, grandma played piano and organ, and everybody in the family played. So, it was always one of those things that was just there. And yeah. I was the, uh, I was the crazy one out of like, honestly, the, everybody in my family, for the most part, the 10 times better musicians than me on it. Like all yeah. of them, everybody, they can outplay me under, a, they can play me under a bus, but they just didn't want to live the the crazy part of like the right. struggle part of the music thing. I'm like, dude, you're crazy. And I did, I just stuck with it. And uh, it just, I keep rolling with the punches as they come. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes sense. Uh, when did you first like start thinking about going professional then? Uh, it was high school. Whenever I was, uh, first time I thought about going proper professional, I had, um, there's, a, there's a TV show that used to be on PBS. I think it's still there, Austin City Limits. They used to have it every Saturday night. And my mom and I were watching um, Robert, or John Hammond, John Hammond Jr. Um, he's this Delta Blues guy, plays a lot of Robert Johnson type, uh, a lot of Robert Johnson tunes. Uh, and we were watching it and he was playing the song come on in my kitchen i remember specifically that moment my mom she was just watching me and whenever his performance was finally done she was like you were just mesmerized by that right? and at that moment i was like man if i could just whatever it was that sense of like possession that happened by just watching that i got so enveloped into it that it was like true love and then that yeah. moment on was like well there's probably not anything i'm ever gonna like as much as this and and that's generally proven to be the case like can't yeah. keep marriages together or relationships but music she stays right there <laughs> yeah well i mean that's i mean it's cool to be able to lock in on on something that young too because i know a lot of people come out of high school like i have no idea what i'm gonna do so <laughs> yeah no I, I i had no idea man like really how to make it work i had right i had these dreams but like to stay in it was, I, I didn't know anybody who had actually really made a career out of doing it, or yeah. much less of being artistic, creative people. Everybody right. had real, real working class jobs, so right, it right. was a real. Leap. Did it have like a like a parent in the music industry or something like that? Like you, <laughs> nothing, man. Not where I was coming from. Yeah. You get to play in church. That's about as good as it gets. And right. I, I worked. I worked for a radio station down in Charleston. That was one of the kind of the another segue into like getting into the business or at least seeing how the mechanics of it work yeah. getting to talk to um whenever whenever good bands would come through or like some of the country bands that play for the radio station i would just kind of sit in the corner and listen and see how these people did their thing and it yeah. just one thing would lead to another yeah that's pretty cool because i feel like uh kind of the stereotype with with some of the more with like a lot of pop stars and stuff like oh they must have had some connection to the industry to help them break in and it's cool to hear stories about people you know really just coming out of nowhere um because it's obviously it's a harder path but it's probably a, a rewarding one so yeah it, it can be rewarding for sure but you really get into that thing like when you start digging the layers back you're like wait a second so-and-so's family member knew them and that and it's somebody had given me a a, a, a former tour manager we had who became a manager that we had this guy jb he uh he gave me this really good analogy of whenever he was in college of uh, this professor it was one of those amphitheater style seating classrooms and this professor told everybody to grab a piece of paper out of their notebooks and ball that paper up and he put a trash can in the front of the class and he said everybody you guys everybody has to stay in their seat but you have to throw your uh, paper and try to land in this trash can. And so everybody gave it a shot. And he's like, okay, so what I just showed you guys, what privileges. 
And in that, like, that's the shot you get to take. Like, if you have that sense of privilege, you have a better chance of making it here. But those guys from the back of the room, man, when they make that glory shot, it's like, then the world really, right. <laughs> you know, yeah. it is that like, yeah, yeah you're oh, close, definitely. you got it. But those ones who come out of nowhere, those shots that you don't see coming, those are the ones that are just like, that yeah. really shakes the planet up a bit. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's yeah, always a lot harder journey to get into a, an industry if you don't have any connections and you're just starting from scratch so so yeah then, i mean you know that story too man that's part of what you're living too Vince. <laughs> yeah, i mean <laughs> i guess yeah it's uh yeah yeah you, i remember even having a college professor who said to me when i decided to major in history he's like he's like so um you know your parents okay with this because i don't i don't you know <laughs> I, I hope you I hope you get a job by the time we're done with this. I was like, well, thanks. That's encouraging. Yeah. I understand your passion, but I want to make sure you're okay, man. Yeah. Good dude. Yeah. Yeah. He's <laughs> this like, is gonna be hard. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Pretty much. So that was yeah, that was interesting. But yeah, made it work, I guess. So right on, dude. So how did you get into like forming Carolina Liar then? The Carolina Liar thing was really it was cool how it came about. I had this band. It's called Susie's Parlor. And in that band, um, there's a guy who's in this band called The Voids now, my buddy Jeremy, and he's got his own thing called Beardo. And he's, man, what a genius. We were all these cool people, but we had just, all of us had been out of like music school for a little while. Yeah. So we were writing these really super artsy fartsy kind of songs, things that were in time signatures that I could never really count. <laughs> just, just bizarre stuff. That band eventually broke up, but we had a, Rob Caballo, this big guy over at Hollywood Records, and he had done the Green Day Records at this point and a whole bunch of other just massive projects. Uh, yeah. One thing after another, he's just the one. He, he came to a show that we played. And that particular night, like, the show was good. And he was like, well, you know, man, you should maybe think about this band really kind of being your thing. And, and at that point in time, I would never listen to that conversation from anybody because when you're in a band, this, you know, it's your thing. And the funny thing was not too long after that show, maybe two weeks or so, that band just decided that this ain't working. So at that point, it was, uh, I was in the studio with uh, the guy, there was a gentleman I was working with, his name's uh, Tim James. He's got a rock label called Rock Mafia, and he's the one that brought Rob Cavallo out for the show. Um, and he told me at the time, he was like, man, if you can come up with another band name, um, we can we we'll start kind of picking up and make another record because you can write. So I started thinking about it and giving him options of what I thought a good band name would be. And he was not having any of them. He thought they were all pretty <laughs> lame. And at one yeah. point I was telling him about growing up down south and this particular neighborhood I grew up in was uh, was always, and it's just colorful. It's kind of like the big fish kind of neighborhood where there was just one crazy thing after another. Um, you know, people fighting, uh, so-and-so getting killed, meet by something, like strange things. But typical, like, kind of Southern stuff that you would hear, at least in my mind. So right. I would tell him about this stuff. And then one morning, we were still working on something. And he was, uh, I told him some story about two guys that were shooting at each other in this trailer beside the trailer I grew up. Like, in the, like there was a little single wide trailer beside my house. And these two gentlemen were shooting shotguns at each other inside this house. They got a little oh, tipsy. They didn't kill each other, but they were just shooting at each other. And he was like, man, you are the biggest liar I think I have ever met. And I was like, no, it's, it's a true story. It's really happened. And he was like, where are you from again? What, what part of the world? And I was like, well, South Carolina. And then he was like, dude, that has to be the name of whatever it is you work on from this point forward, because nobody's ever going to believe anything you tell them. And it stuck. We looked at it up. We, we did a quick trademark search and everything. And just to see if there was any other bands or movies or anything that, and nothing. I was like, all right, that's cool, man. And then that's it. And it's, that's, it's funny because that, uh, it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy built inside that name, like everything that right. continued to happen. And as the career somehow manages to sustain itself, even in the slow periods, it's still kind of, it all becomes one of those, those, like big fish stories <laughs> yeah no, it's, i mean it's definitely a catchy name that's for sure I mean, it's it's memorable so <laughs> yeah right you're like what in the world is it's funny when that thing we first started it people were 
they couldn't quite get it right. Like your Alabama flowers, it's like, how did you hear that? What? Like, <laughs> Alabama flowers? Right. What? That's an insult. We're from South Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. So like, so if I understand then like before this band formed, like you just decided to move out to California then and you're yeah. working in the, in the music business kind of behind the scenes or something? Yeah. Yeah, I, I came to California because I thought I was a good guitar player. And okay. when I landed out here, I studied at Musicians Institute. I was studying vocals and guitar there and got here and realized rather quickly that my my guitar playing was capable, but in, in reality, nowhere near. Nope, not even close to what was coming up and like what these kids were doing at school. And so I had a music business teacher. Um, and I knew that I could, I, I always loved songwriting. That was my like real passion behind music was hearing stories inside songs. Yeah. Um, and I had one teacher, the business teacher at the school told her I would do anything she told me to do. And I would make her look bad if she could find me an internship somewhere. And I just do it. I, no questions about it. She called, she found an internship with, um, Diane Warren, the songwriter mm. who wrote, uh, uh, what is it? Unbreak my heart um the big aerosmith song from armageddon um oh, okay. like one massive huge hit after another she just did something with lady gaga still she's complete she just bought a building literally an entire skyscraper type building oh my she's God. so so rich and so like just <laughs> successful man <laughs> i got a job with her and i didn't really quite understand the kind of stuff she was doing but it helped because it got me out of my like kind of jazzbo state of mind of playing guitar and really paying attention to how pop songs were written and so i, I worked for her for about six years um from when i was 20 years old until about 25 at her studio and i would play coffee shops at night and do any sort of other gigs i could play with my own stuff and then work on whatever she needed me to but she was really cool about it like as long as i did everything i was supposed to do i could use her studios every day of the week um, oh, wow. as long as I didn't get in the way, as long as I wasn't yeah. causing problems or anything like that, whenever she needed me to work on something, I'd be available, of course. And so I got to go in and use these rooms and just try to figure out how to put songs together and do things that way. And That's that helped. Cool. Yeah, it was cool, man. And it was good because I got to work directly with some of the records that she was working on and be immediately inside what like people were using, what new sounds were being used and stuff like that. I never quite became a good producer, but I at least knew how to put together good demos to get people to be like, okay, I know what he's trying to do. So yeah, that's <laughs> kind of, yeah, that's a really cool way of sort of getting involved in the industry too, because you get to learn all the different aspects of it and how it works before you even become, you know, the, the professional musician yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I know you see it and you get to learn the conversations that people have when the artists leave. That's the thing. Like that's yeah. there's the real inside trip. Is like, you know, an artist will leave and it will just be like, God, I hate that person. <laughs> you know? like the truth comes out. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, oh man, we gotta hire that other singer to bring somebody in here so they can sing the real parts. And it's like yeah. it's it's amazing because you see like you it, it's in some ways you're getting to look behind the curtain. It's the Wizard of Oz thing in some ways. Yeah. But then the other part is like, dude, okay, I know how much I need to work to get better. Like Right. In order to be somebody like what she was and some of these people who are who have sustained themselves in this music business, man, they work hard. I know a lot of people see it as, and the problem with musicians is we uh, we classify what we do as playing. We play music. And so that that word choice by itself is very debilitating to the idea of what musicians actually do. Right. So we'll be out there complaining. It's like, why well, work so hard? And people are like, yeah, but you play. It's like, well, yeah. <laughs> but right. it's it's a hard yeah. word people just assume like oh you just go up there play an instrument and then boom you're done yeah it's a <laughs> yeah it's the word choice man i guess it's semantics yeah. at that point but it is really yeah. like well we did it to ourselves in some ways but it is you, you do learn like getting in there and, and like watching how the machine works you can reverse engineer kind of like right. how should i build myself like what can i do to kind of give myself a better chance of surviving this business. Yeah, and that makes total sense. And what did your family think about it when you decided, oh, I'm going to move to California? Were they okay with it or? Nah. <laughs> Not at all. I mean, my mom, <laughs> but the funny, the weird, the super weird thing was the weirdest part of it all. When I was a kid, 
had two imaginary friends and both of them, uh, their parents got killed in California. And, yeah. and so both of them wanted, they had their own like cool go-kart and they lived with their grandparents. This is a very involved set of imaginary friends. Wow, I guess. But they, yeah. had, they had their own go-kart. They had all this cool stuff and they were from California. And so my mom kind of knew her whole life that eventually I would end up out here. Like that okay. was just going through the process. And yeah. so when it came up, it was, it was, you know, kind of sad, but, and the struggle that comes and goes with this music business, it probably took some of their life away just as much as mine. But ultimately they've always been pretty supportive. Like they, where their care comes from is just more of the human condition. They're like, dude, this is, you're miserable. Yeah. But yeah. you do, you, you, you just can't, I personally can't do anything else. I started, I teach music now for kids. Oh, and wow, okay. Yeah, yeah, I teach. I get like adult clients. I teach them how to sing. Um, That's cool. I not really teach them how to sing. I just kind of help them with what they already have. Right. Which is really cool. And then I teach super little, little guys, like three-year-olds up. Like, yeah, that's just, awesome. Oh, dude, it's the best. It's one of those things where at first I was really snobby musician and being like well i'll never do something like that i need to just be writing songs to like <laughs> it got me back to a point of music where it's a sense of discovery where yeah. you come back to where that spark is and to see that happen in people from children to adults to give them that like that discovery moment it's like oh that's cool that it, it validates any of the musical stuff that i have like internally like I think all people struggle with whatever their professional professional lives are. Oh, yeah. some degree, everybody's kind of like, "What? I think I'm faking it." Like, right, I don't, right. How did I get successful? I don't yeah. know. Yeah, <laughs> makes know? sense. Kind of like what we were talking about with the history before. Yeah. It's like, well, I just kind of keep finding things, and it's that's right. It's the same thing. You just kind of your passion kind of carries you towards these things, and and out of that because it's something passionate, and you believe in it, and you love it you don't necessarily respect the fact that you're, you become an expert from your observation of that love and yeah. you share, you know, it's really like, especially you being an oral historian, like yeah. you get to tell people this stuff and you get to watch it happen like in real time. And it's kind of the same thing with music, how it can, how that you can construct it and give it yeah. to people watch. They're like, Oh my God, that's, a that's what, a major third is and like yeah these are intervals that's how this works these are the mechanics that's these scales work this way and this kind of one if you move one note a half degree in into a concept it will make you feel sad or make you feel confused there's like it's it's fantastic yeah. no, definitely it's i mean i think one thing that you know i've just for my own life you know i can relate to that because it's just what you think you're going to do later on is <laughs> it's, it's all just an idea, but really the journey is this <laughs> crooked path with lots of twists and turns. And my background was in oral history originally. And uh, then when I, I got my master's degree and just got a couple of jobs and then it, it moved to the next job. And that's just, it's all about just kind of taking steps forward and kind of this general idea of where you want to go, uh -huh. but uh, not really knowing exactly the path to that. So. Right. Now, a question I have for you, whenever, because this is something that I saw, like, as I yeah. got older, like, all these random jobs, like, some of the jobs that you had, did you ever find yourself, like, wondering, why am I doing this right now? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, <laughs> and, and then yeah. the thing yeah. comes up you're in some magic job that you never thought yeah. you'd be in, and then you end up using the skill from that job you thought never had anything to do with your life. And it's like, holy crap, if I would have yes. never had a job before. Yep. this with it, I, I would have never known how to do this like oh yeah no i mean definitely <laughs> you know? because i feel like the first job you get also when you're like pursuing a career in something it's it's hard to know what to make is that at, part of you is just like okay i just want to get my foot into some field, in the door. you know just have yeah. a job uh, because it really sucks when you're at home and you're playing for jobs all the time and you're like oh my gosh you know when am i gonna get something <laughs> and then right. you finally get something and you're like yes i got it and then you're like, okay, what am I going to do with this now? <laughs> Where does How this does go this from work here? For the rest of my life? <laughs> yeah, so it's a it's a journey for sure. And um, I guess the the main thing for people to take home is just just keep enjoying it, making the most of it, and trying to stay on the stay on the path to wherever you want to go, and just kind of embrace the waves. <laughs> yeah, totally. That's what it is. You just keep finding these threads. I imagine you must have found some really interesting connections 
when you're dealing with history that way, that's just like, holy, there's this one guy who was somehow yeah. to here to here to here. And this one thing that he carried, like, what's the longest thread that you've discovered? Like, well, I mean, I guess, I guess the sort of the, the best way of describing this would be like, you know, just thinking about, I, I've done, for example, a lot of like ancestry research. Sure. Um, I've done like my own family history research. That was one of my like big uh, projects in high school and college. I just work on family history research side project because I was interested in like what my family, you know, where they came from. My parents might tell me some kind of generic information like, oh, they're sure. from, you know, Switzerland and from Ireland and Scotland. But I'm like, okay, but who were these people? Like, yeah, they're not what's just, their story? Yeah, they're exactly. not just like, they're not just dust. They, they're, there's something real there. Exactly. And so I guess the, you know, just give an example, you know, I had uh, one ancestor going back in the 1600s who uh, basically he came to, you know, sort of the colonial times in, in the United States before it was actually a country in sort of colonial England in North America mm -hmm. and Massachusetts. And he came there though as a, as a servant because he was too poor to, to afford any uh, ticket himself. So he decided, okay, I'm going to uh, basically uh, give myself to this person as a servant. I'm going to work off the debt when I get there um, right. because he himself didn't have really anything going on back home. And so he gets there and he's working off his debt in a situation that's really kind of pretty sketchy because you don't know how yeah, your you master is going to, you know, treat you. Really you be. Yeah. yeah. You don't know if you're even going to be ever free technically, because some of these people might just keep you forever. And like, Oh, you haven't yeah. worked it off yet. Haven't worked off your debt. And um, anyway, long story short, you know, he ended up not only working off his debt, but he actually married the daughter of his master and then inherited all the property uh, from his master crap. later. So, crap. Really? Yeah. yeah so, wow. That's so, a power move. It's, that's yeah, that's right. that's right. Talk about, yeah, making it work. Yeah. Yeah, that's but, destiny, um, man. Cool. I mean, all, all these stories are just like, you know, uh, because I'm kind of like, in terms of ancestry, I'm, I'm kind of like a European mutt. My family comes from all over the place. And it's just interesting to see all these people from different European countries that never would have met each other if they didn't come to the U.S. Sure. And, you know, I, you know, family that came from Switzerland, the 1800s. I had family that came from Sweden, the 1800s. And um, I, I guess what it really just shows when you think about all these different people that you descend from, is it's incredible because all these people just had to meet in the right time and place for you to exist. And then you right. had to have that happen, you know, millions and millions of times in a row. And so it's yeah. kind of like winning the lottery, just the fact that you're here today, because all these people had to meet just for you to be here. And you got thousands and thousands of people that just happen to be the same place, same time. It's crazy. Same time, the whole thing of like them being able to survive yeah, to be smart enough to be attractive enough to be able to mate in that right. context to be right. to, the, all of these factors that really go into it and that ultimately makes up who you are like it really does that that yeah. cell cell memory is a real thing like there are things inside of you that will date back to like different kind of behavior and yeah, that just exactly. keeps fueling whatever this universal thing ultimately will become like there's something bigger that, of course, we're all working for, but we don't know what it is to a certain right. extent. But right. there's a reason, there's a purpose underneath this that I don't think that we've necessarily acquired the knowledge to understand yet. Like, as you think yeah, about I mean, how old the universe is, it's like, it's well. yeah, pretty, pretty incredible. I mean, I guess the my, my biggest takeaway from that is just, you know, when you look at your ancestry and stuff, it's just kind of, uh, well, you know, all these people have made it work before you and you come from these people. So why can't you make it work too? You're um, going to do it too. You're a survivor. You're already history of survivors. Right. You know, you're exactly, the result yeah. of survivors. Uh, so, oh, that's really cool. It's, Magic, a, yeah, it's really. pretty, pretty, uh, pretty interesting thing. And so now that gets me thinking, um, you know, your, your big hit song mm -hmm. was, you know, show me what I'm looking for. That was, that was when you first got on the map, I guess. Yeah. Um, and as I understand, you wrote that song with uh, your, your bandmates in like 20 minutes? Yeah, yeah with the Tobias Carlson. He, you know, it's, it's interesting because both of us, we had various, like he, he grew up in uh, a religious household and yeah. so did I. And then both of us were in California and, it, it, and well, he had come from New York via he's Swedish, New York, and then LA. 
And so when he got out here, by the time both of us were just getting into our 30s, um, we were like, at that point, we had tried a lot of things. And, <laughs> and it's all, and the thing about California, at least Los Angeles for real, is like, this week I'm going to try wheatgrass and now it's yoga and then I'm going to start chanting. And it's literally one thing after another of just constantly, okay, what in God's name am I actually looking for out of all of this? Like, what is this, you know? Um, it's just one of the, and that's really where it came from was we, we'd had discussions before about religion and just life. And so he had just like, he literally, we were sitting in this living room and he's like, all right, here, I had this idea. I just want to do these like four chords, major, minor kind of feel thing and show me what I'm looking for. And he's like, I got to use the restroom. And I was like, okay, cool. That's all I need. And he left the room i knew what everything kind of was and i wrote the whole all the lyrics and based the melody was kind of there it was just oh my gosh it was just there and we just kind of laughed about it and we recorded it the next morning we just did a demo pass on some vocals and a quick guitar thing um and he's really fast with production so he turned the whole song around in 24 hours or so and we sent that back to, uh, Mac, to back to Max Martin. And he's like, yeah, this will be one of the songs. This is what I need to hear. But um, we ended up like what we ended up capturing in there. Um, most of those vocals are still the original ones that we had. There's a lot of yeah. background vocals and new stuff. And Martin came in and cleaned it and made it better timing wise. We right. tried to beat that original performance, but we couldn't in a lot of ways. There's still so much of that that was captured in that particular moment that time frame where we were in our lives like yeah. what is it we're actually after out here and still i haven't come up with anything as big as that song was and the funny the, ultimately for us when we wrote it we're like well it's a cool song but it's probably not like it's not a max martin kind of hit you right. know it's not those ones it's like that's a juggernaut that thing is gonna just keep us paid for life never didn't think it was just an honest song and at that yeah. point, it's like, yeah, this is just, this is a real song for us. Um, this works. It's cool. It's like, it's cool, but yeah. never. And Craig Coleman, when he heard that, when we had the first meeting, as far as like getting signed to Atlantic Records, that's the song. Whenever we were sitting at the studio, we played that. He stood up, got up off the couch. He walked back over to the console that we were working off of. And he just looked at it. He's like, this is it. This is the song. And we all just kind of like, nah, this isn't it. We got a song we wrote with Max. It's like a real, it's a proper, like, yeah. just one of those things that sounds like a really fast car. As soon as the song starts up, you're like, oh, man, I want to be a part of that one. And But Craig was always, this is the song. This is the thing. This is the one that's going to, like, make this thing work. And, wow. and it has. It's nuts, yeah. man. I get, like, it's still part of, like, the, that kid David DeHobrick, DeBovrick, he still uses it whenever he gives cars away or helps people out in their lives there's like all oh, wow. these moments where that song is just like yeah it really has its own life it's absolutely amazing i got nothing to do and even before i wrote it to some weird degree it already had a life of its own it just i just got to be the receptor of just like just put it down you know and i just get to be the the guy that was lucky enough to channel it and i get yeah. you know i like i get to go and play it live every now and then and you know <laughs> <laughs> getting to be like a ghost in the room in all these people's lives it's, it's amazing that's one of the coolest parts of it yeah like, life moments. yeah cool. i mean talk about talk about making most of uh, those 20 minutes that's a <laughs> yeah right dude that 20 minutes has lasted a long time yeah. <laughs> seems Longest like it. 20 minutes of my life <laughs> yeah i mean i remember when that song first came out and it is funny how you talk about how that song is like being like it goes to the room and, and that song being important in people's lives because it's one of those songs where um, you can remember exactly where you were when you, when like, you heard, heard it. it. And, and that's, that's one of those cool things because I think one of the most amazing things to me about music is, I mean, not just the fact that almost everyone listens to music, which is one of those few entertainment things that everyone likes. Everybody has, yeah. I mean... But the, but the fact that, uh, you know, it can take you back to a time and place that you were, it can, you can like remember exactly where I remember, for example, I was listening uh, to that song when I was in Bulgaria, actually traveling and, and visiting what? some friends. And we were about to go into this old cave in Bulgaria. And I was listening to that in the car. 
And I remember that vividly, exactly where what? I was when I heard that song. And so it's dude, it's that just, is yeah. so cool. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's so just, awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's just yeah, the it's uh I always kind of think of music almost as being like like background music to your own little personal movie because yeah. so much of, of people are just listening to music as kind of uh you know kind of as background music to their own lives and their experiences and what they're going through and dealing with um, sure and so it's yeah it's amazing just when you can we can take different songs and, and place them exactly where you were so yeah it's a wild time traveling machine you know yeah. when you think about it like i was i was teaching a kid like her favorite band is uh, My Chemical Romance. She okay. loves the guitar players in that band. And so she was just really in a hurry to like learn these parts. And I was like, wait, you have to appreciate the moment of what you're doing. You are literally inside the head of your favorite guitar player right now. As you're playing through this, you get to think like what he's thinking. You're moving the way that they're moving. You're literally in the time frame. You are embodying the moment that they recorded this. Like that, yeah. like that's almost a sacred thing in some, like, and whatever our time field is that we yeah. exist in. Like, right. It's like, you're really trying to capture the moment, that space and time. Like, that's somebody had said something really cool about music before. It's like, art decorates space, but music decorates time. And that's kind of the neat thing, like, because you have that time frame where you're there, and it's like, because of that cave moment and that song, like, all of a sudden, that that moment is is enveloped in that that song yes. is in that time you know yeah. and it's like it becomes your history it's yes it is yeah <laughs> you yeah, know? It, yeah definitely i mean it's uh it is a kind of a unique aspect i think of being a human being is just having these interesting connections i think you get the same thing with like a sense of smell like i there's this smell for example that i don't even know what it is but whenever i smell it it reminds me of like grandparents house oh sure and so yeah. it's just like, you know, these weird things, these little senses that uh, can bring and you back you to different places. And then you get that synesthesia with stuff like that, man. Because yeah. then you feel the emotion from that yeah. thing. And that's real. You can't, like, you can't yeah. discount it. At one point in time, we would be like, oh, I'm just being nostalgic and nostalgia right. is whatever. But you, it's a real chemical reaction. Like, you can look at this thing in, a, in an MRI. Yeah. Like, that part of your brain is active. You can't right. argue that. That's, yeah. that's a real physical thing. Yeah, definitely. It it is. It's it's fascinating. Um, yeah. it's a cool thing. But I mean, what's interesting though to me about your career is that you continue to make you know really good music. Um, obviously, it's you've now moved more towards I guess working with a new group that you have uh, sure. called the Federal Empire. Yeah, that band's really been fun. Like that was like one of those happy accidents that like, um we that was never a band i and we ever intended it to be a band it was more so uh mckay and keith and i were all just really just writing i was i'm actually i was working on a carolina liar record the third one when we all okay. met and um when we got together we were like well let's just write these songs and we'll license them to djs because it was like that really big dj movement that was happening there and so we wrote them with like the intention of being really kind of catchy, but working within the, the DJ kind right. of uh, that DJ perspective, like how this can work inside of a DJ world. Because Keith was really producing a ton of just big kick drum sounding things. And yeah. we had a bunch of really random guitars at my house and my studio at that time. So there was also always some weird instrument. Keith would come over. He's like, I got this kind of hook. And I was like, oh, try it on this weird piece of gear. Let's see what happens with this. And I would put up microphones in the room. And we would all just sing this hook and whatever, like, broken mandolin or some old, like, weird baritone guitar or something like that. And we'd all just sing it around in this space and just kind of get into the idea of, like, what it was. And it, and that record ended up kind of taking the space of what the third Carolina record would be. But I'm going to release at some point, maybe this year or next year, that that, that other Carolina record because it's oh, really cool. cool. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and I, that's awesome. I think there's some really good songs on that record. They just weren't as punchy. I think those songs are more applicable now, which is interesting time-wise for the Carolina stuff, yeah. um, than they would have been then. Like, after okay. all this pandemic stuff and, yeah. like, very sentimental songs. And so, like, we produced yeah. the thing so that it's, like, more real music musicians playing. So it's not produced our program. It's more real playing. Um so it kind of lasts. It has a, a, the ability to last a little bit. Federal Empire stuff, I think, is kind of uh, it's kind of fun and kitschy, loud, 
and it's yeah. serious. It's a party band, man. That thing, you go out yeah. and play that stuff anywhere, and people will just immediately start dancing. That's yeah. Like, I mean, it seemed to have time, man. yeah. It seemed to have a little bit of different vibe to it and stuff. It was cool. Um, it was it, punchy. I mean, it's kind of punk like that too, because it's a lot of like in your face, kind of like, "Hey, man!" Yeah. Like, and it's all making fun of us. The idea was to write these songs that are ultimately just—I mean, they're love songs and a lot of breakup, divorcee kind of songs. But still, even in the songs that are breakup songs, they're funny because it's like, "Ah, eh, we're just kind of just being human here," and and it's right. silly, you know? Yeah. Well, that actually makes me think then about uh, the song "American Dream," and right. so. That one, tell me a little bit about uh, that song and the inspiration for it. Well, it's funny because American Dream was, I mean, I'm trying to make sure I got this memory right in my head. American Dream first started off as uh, the, we were thinking about writing about seven deadly sins. Mm -hmm. That's kind of where it came into. It's like, how can we apply that to kind of this, this idea of all of us doing these things like, uh, but, you know, it's like, I'll, I'll eat too much. I do this, these things. And it's like, well, it's kind of the American way. And <laughs> the, the more we got into it was like, and at that time, I was getting into the, the second part of getting a divorce and looking back at my relationship there. Mm -hmm. And like, it, I could take that song and the parts that I contributed to it and be like, wait, this is my life too, man. I, I went and got like the super fast car and I got a big house. And I found this like super cool lady, but she was way out of my league and she needed a whole lot more than I could afford to give and which is fine. But it was just this whole thing of like yeah. excess out of control. Like I need all of these things and it, all that stuff. And I kept pushing for these things and I just couldn't quite obtain them all. And yeah. in that it ended up kind of killing me. It took years of like rebuilding my life after pursuing this thing that i thought was so important and it's like taking that and putting that into the song and being able to laugh about it now like while i'm playing it, it's like it's really yeah. my own personal story everybody kind of it's cool with songs like that because people can hear it take it and use it in the way that it applies to them but for me the way that i can play something like that a thousand times over is knowing that like well yeah as i smoke weed in this netflix nation laying in bed all day i was naked like yeah, yeah. I, I did a lot of the stuff that's in that song. <laughs> a lot of it. Maybe all yeah. of it. <laughs> well, know? I mean, it, it does really talk about, like, I mean, this this obsession with just wanting more and more and more. And people sure. just, by human nature, seem to never be satisfied with something, which can be yeah. good and bad if you don't have the right balance to it. Because it's great to want yeah. to, like, continue to improve your life. Obviously, if you're getting carried away, we are constantly become like greedy almost. That you can just start tearing your own life apart. Um, yeah, you kill yourself over it. You you like you think it's so important. You're like, man, I just I, I miss all of the good things, like all of this obsession over yeah. this house and car. And it's like, ultimately, if you got like, it's just. I mean, I think capitalism is amazing i don't think we would never have the innovation that you have without that sense of reward of like pushing and right. going elevating for better and bigger things and people knowing they can make their lives better by trying to make it everything better you know ultimately right. the idea is to take take an idea and make that idea better and you just keep building yeah uh, i think it's great but there is a part of that like where i think as a society and even on an individual level you get wrapped up in the stuff that isn't important it's not like if you like i mean when you come down to like man if you got air conditioning and you got electricity and clean water like you you really yeah. won when you get to see the yeah. rest of the world man it's like yeah dude we are are good if we could just get our health care thing kind of happening for everybody right oh my we like this is if you compare it on a historical level yeah. This has never happened. There's right. no history, I mean, or at least that we have written, where yeah. this kind of society can exist. Like, we're all, I mean, there's a lot of fighting going on, which is going to happen. Yeah. But on a scale to this level and to have singularity where yeah. we are, like, to be able to communicate the way we have through these devices and these kind of one world thoughts, the stuff that we have, the potential is, is immense. If in some ways we can just kind of recognize the beauty of what 
like our crazy little human minds have brought forth and just be like, wait, take a break, man. Like, look what yeah, you did. Right. Chill this out is for nice. a second. Yeah. This is beautiful. You guys, yeah. like we all of this stuff is ultimately can come from love and to, to take care of each other. Like there's a way that we can do all of it, have it all, and make everybody's lives better. Like you think of I, I always get into those things of like these people who are such great finance people who know how to make money grow and how to make things bigger and better. And if you, if they took that kind of knowledge and applied it to everyone and allowed people to see like, well, if we do this collectively, not in a communist way, but like, like, if we could teach this rather than using it as a way for just us, we did this and we built better schools and we gave like that. We found these kids in places where they could, excel if we just gave them enough like we could spot these ones who were excelling at this and these kids who are great at music like all of these things could progressively become still capitalist in that way but you can push it and this the way that we're proceeding right now is still we're not there yet but maybe it's just because we're young i mean you know that's the cool thing with history is like when you we boil down the time frame all this stuff it's still pretty young like 200 years what 300 years of of what we're right. at right now yeah i mean as a as a country yeah it's a it's a pretty young experiment still and obviously it's it's got a you know pretty um, you know amazing foundation for you know how it is structured in terms of you know creating this democratic society that you can allow for people to exchange ideas and, and try to make things happen and yeah. the biggest challenge is just getting people to work together you know it's uh <laughs> that's the thing that's really that, it, man it's i like- mean and what's uh, mine is yeah what's what's yours is your was well, how do they say that it's like if it's if it's my money it's uh, there's a way to say it like you just you're, it's not distributed in the right way and yeah it's well, close I mean, it's it's all about just getting people you know to understand that not i mean it's 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 funny because it really is childlike at the end of the day but it's getting people to understand that uh you know you're allowed to disagree with people and you're allowed to make compromises and honestly yeah. that's how civilization is built it's built on that's compromise how it works like that whole uh, thing of having a little bit of conflict is good like that's always a good thing because then the idea can get expanded and you can get people to question things and be like wait we're both thinking the same thing here actually right like it's just we've lost our ability to communicate and i think with yep. music that's if if you can one thing I've come to discover because because of the kind of music that I get to write and have made a living out of, if I can, because I've, I've flared some people up a lot, like really like pissed them off with some of the stuff that I've said. And then ultimately yeah. it's like, I can own that. Let's talk about it. Why don't you tell me what right. you're thinking? Like, how can I understand where you're coming from? Because I grew up in a place that was very working class and I was really super Republican. And I understand why you would be. I do. Right. I'm not judge. I understand why you would go to church and look for why Jesus is important for you. I'm not going to judge that either. I get right. it. I, yeah. I know why there's a purpose and how powerful that purpose can be. But let's talk about like this stuff. And, and if, cause I mean, I've gone from that to being way liberal and still kind of coming back to being able to like, just see it. And because of its music, there's a frequency that can kind of exist where you can hang out with the, the, the most like conservative people and the most liberal and something happens with music where you can be kind of the you can be the the joker in the room or the clown but because of that because you allow yourself to be the one that kind of like can take the punishment a little bit yeah then you get people talking like you get a subject and you can beat the song up you can beat this thing yep. down and it's like all of a sudden you get to have that thing that you need to kind of hate on a little bit. Cause I think everybody ultimately needs like something to beat up on. And then collectively it's kind of like a sports team in that way. It's like, yeah, they can come together. It's like, cool. right. Now you guys are like, Hey, we all like the same thing here. It's cool. Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. <laughs> you know? It's all about building those bridges. So yeah, I think we could do more of it. And I think, I think music applies to, I think art really does it do that in, in so many ways. Like if you look back at history and in, in that context, the first thing that, generally happens when dictators or kind of new regimes come into place the first thing to attack is any sort of free thought or music or anything like because as soon as you take that away then you you lose that sense of communication and right now we have the ability to like inspire people and get them talking like let them you know let it get the anger out and then like all right let's let's see what's up like yeah here's you know it's it's 
it's an idealistic thing, but who knows? But, Maybe we can get there. Yeah, I mean that we have we have nothing to lose, you know. So might as well keep trying because uh, right? what's the alternative? You know, <laughs> yeah, like, we're just gonna die. Yeah, nobody gets out of this thing alive, man. That's the right. thing. It's always interesting to me. It's like it's, it will end. The story does end, you guys. Right. You gotta like might as well gonna, make the most of it. <laughs> yeah, because you don't get to like no matter how hard you like, you think you're gonna be able to keep some ideology around after you've left. Like, what business is it of yours to like tell people how to think after you're dead? That's yeah. lame, man. Get out of the way. Like, right. let the young guys figure this out. It's their world now. You know, just give them some guidance yeah. so they don't blow the whole thing up. But right, right. <laughs> you no, know? that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, also uh, when I was thinking about your uh, the American Dream song that you wrote, huh? um, it's interesting because uh, I, I two things came to mind. One kind of funny, the other one more serious. But on the right. more serious side, um, I was thinking, you know, just of how people perceive the American dream, obviously in the sort of the Hollywoodized version, the stereotype American dream is, you know, talk about your story a little bit, you know, you know, getting rich fast, getting successful, buying everything you want, you know, do whatever you want. Um, but historically really the American dream, at least, you know, I think for many people throughout American history, and I know for a lot of my ancestors was basically being able to go somewhere and being able to survive. Um, you know, True. not living in horrible poverty, you know, not being persecuted for your religious beliefs, um, not dying from diseases, famine or wars. You know, it's just about being able to have an opportunity, giving a shot to, you know, just do something have with your life. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, that's the idea. It's, I mean, it's funny because for me and that it's, it's this whole process of like getting to experience life the way that I've gotten to because of that kind of songwriting. Um, it taught me what my dream was originally coming out here was just be free. That's it. Yeah. That's all you got to do, man. Make enough money to go buy yourself a house somewhere in the middle of nowhere yep. and stay free. You'll have enough money. You'll be fine. And if I would have done that, my life would have been really, really easy. But I got caught up on the other side of it. And it flipped from being able to just be in a place where I could afford a decent life, normal one, to like, oh man, I need this and I got to be in touch with these people and blah, blah, blah. And I got to yeah. go eat at this restaurant because they won't respect me unless I'm here. And, and it just, blows up. Yeah. Yeah. It just yeah. blows up in your face. And it's like, no, the ultimate American dream is, 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 is as America as it sounds, is freedom. That right. ability to be free to think, to make art, to grow food, to be free, like to actually yeah. really explore the idea of what freedom means. Like, yeah, like these people can have their thoughts and they can have family the way that they want to have their family and you can too. Yeah. And the idea is not to judge each other and start fighting, trying to kill each other, trying to make people conform. You're like, well, right. they live over there and that's their world. That's cool. But we all collectively have this idea of what America is. And when it comes time for us all to come together, we will. But yeah. in the other times, like, hey, man, they it's the holidays they celebrate that's cool i don't have to be involved like that music's cool they're listening to but i don't like it it's cool they know that i don't like yeah. it i don't need to go over and yell at them <laughs> you know i'm gonna pick a fight and you got yeah. music stuck <laughs> 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 no it's weird like I, I just don't get what happened like where are well, as far as a country going right now like i just i really hope we get back to or not even get back, but get to, because I don't think we've ever quite gotten there yet. Mm -hmm. The idea is there yeah. for sure. We see the vision, but these, like that crooked road you were talking about earlier, it's yeah. it's very crooked. We haven't quite got there, but all these things, I know all of this stuff that we're going through right now is important. Like these oh, yeah. things have to be in place. If they're not, if we didn't have the struggle, we didn't do these things, if like the music we listened to or the art or the history, if it wasn't there, it, this wouldn't be where we are at the moment. So this phase yeah. in the history of this country has to happen. Right. There's no way we just have yeah, to accept. I mean, yeah, things change and, you know, and, uh, you know, bet you, I think throughout every country's history, there's good times and bad times. You know, we're just, yeah. be thankful that it's not a civil war. You know, there's been worse times. So, yeah. um, and uh, I think also the big thing is the majority, I think, of Americans all want pretty much the same thing. You know, you? Just to be able to live a normal life, you know, take care of their family. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of little, you know, minor cultural things that we compete over. But at the end of the day, people pretty much want the same thing. It's not, it's not like nope. you're, you know, living in some of these countries with, you know, 
horrible authoritarian regimes that are controlling everything you do. So no, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's just not that. And it's, I think if, if, if we get to a point in our systems here where people are open to like real, that sense of world education without it being like, like, don't worry, we're not trying to change. Just give me perspective, like right. to be able to see like what the struggle is and how, not like it's not one of those things you're pointing your finger at a kid and be like you should be grateful it's like no no just look and yeah. and see like as a society as a, as a country what collectively all of you guys have agreed to do and what you've done without yeah. even realizing you guys have made a social contract that has yeah. made this thing work this is a handshake deal it's literally people could go out on the streets and decide they're going to drive the other way and just cause massive accidents any day of the week. But everybody agrees that right. traffic is going to go this way and it's going to go the other way. Like that's yeah. a man. We've all agreed to that. It's fine. Right. It gets yeah. long. That's right. <laughs> you know? Pretty much everyone wants to follow that. No one wants to. Yes. You know, most people don't want to go the wrong way down the highway. No. So. <laughs> no, it works. There are things, there are systems in place yeah. that like you've done. And I'm like, dude, just take a break. Breathe it out. Like some of these systems are tricky, but they will work. Like ultimately, everybody, ultimately, all people are good people. Everybody yeah. has good in them. That's if it didn't, like we wouldn't be here today. Honestly, right. there, there's just no way. Of course, there's a few bad apples, but the majority of people want nothing but good things for everybody and their neighbor. Like, yeah, that's no, definitely. The yeah, you know, all religions, all things ultimately want people to be happy with what their sense of happiness is yeah yeah crazy that makes sense well on a, on a less serious note the other thought that came to my <laughs> mind when i was hearing that song um so when i heard you mentioning like burger and fries and like uh -huh. supersize my bacon and uh give me you know give me an apple pie um, yeah <laughs> <laughs> immediately came to my mind is those occasional days when i go and get junk food from mcdonald's and it, it just it just that pictured in my head of just eating mcdonald's and driving down you know yes. the highway or something like that like ooh, america you know <laughs> got it right now one hand in that wheel with a burger in the yeah. other yeah oh. just, yeah <laughs> <laughs> those moments are magic too though man i yeah. have those like days where it's like man we played some place in uh it was it i can't remember if it was oklahoma or, uh, but they, it's one of those places that had one of these enormous hamburgers. Like the thing was probably eight pounds. It was when I was still eating red meat. It was yeah. so good. It was the gnarliest thing. But we had, because of that audacity, we had such a good time. There was, it's not something you do every day, but there was right. a part of that that was just like, it's a memory that we will have forever. Like all of the band and everybody around that, just because it was so just kind of dumb, but in that like in that dumbness like there's a sense of community that could happen because of it and yeah. that is that's kind of the cool that's the other side of the american dream where it's kind of silly but in that it's like dude that's it's good like those yeah. moments are awesome yeah mcdonald's man i had the best times of my life when i was a kid sometimes yeah. like leaving school and going getting a hamburger and a coke it's like yeah this is a rad <laughs> yeah i know so, i'm like First sense yep. of freedom, you know, and like I'm, I get to do this by myself. I'm a man now. It's like no, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean those those little moments that you you know will carry with you the rest of your life, even if they seem you know kind of meaningless, but they mean a lot to you. So yeah, yeah, it becomes a, a part of your your DNA. Yeah. So I guess long story short, for me, if you like see on Spotify that song like trickle up like a by quite a bit all of a sudden one day that's probably just me at mcdonald's you know just hanging out i love it <laughs> <laughs> yeah dude that's what i'm talking about that's the way we're supposed to do it blow it up however we can that's right there you go that's <laughs> and so uh, thinking of kind of funny things i'm sure you being you know throughout all these different journeys in the music industry do you have any like kind of really funny stories that pop into your head about just your career or anything that happened? Oh man, there are so many just crazy, weird, good stories. Uh, I don't even know like where to begin. Like one of the, I mean, for some reason, the first thing that pops into my mind is being in New York. We were playing the Beacon Theater one night. And I don't know if you remember this tennis player, John McEnroe. Do you remember him? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I and I was kind of freaking because I was, when I was a kid, John McEnroe was just like, he was the guy that just had an attitude problem. He was just this right. like, rock roll tennis player. Like, yeah. what does that even mean these days? 
But all of a sudden, out of nowhere, here comes John McEnroe walking down the street. And I was like, what? And like, this is weird. And he's coming into the theater and he's got a Les Paul with him, like a 1957 left-handed gold top Les Paul. That guitar is worth, I mean, I saw it from the case and I kind of knew what was going on just by the case alone, because the cases for guitars like that are outrageously expensive on their own. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. dude, are you just like walking down the street with that guitar? And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah you know, it's nothing. I was like, that's like a 50s model. He's like, yeah, it's a 57 gold top, but it's cool, man. Nobody bothers you around here. And it was just one of those like moments. It was like, man, this is so bizarre. To, like, yeah, random. Yeah. John McEnroe coming in to play a show. <laughs> this is so cool, man. Is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you get those moments. Like, I mean, I've had some weird ones. Like, I ended up on a, a uh, I ended up at a party one night with Donald Trump and uh, the managers that I had, like years before he became like anything close to getting elected. But Right. Just like looking back to that moment, just being like, "Wow, oh, why was I there?" Like it was yeah, a black that's... thing. We got held up in New York, and my manager and I at the time was like, his dad was at this party, and he's like, "You'll just come meet us over where the party is." And I showed up wearing some like old Playboy T-shirt, and yeah. everybody else is all in a suit, and it's just like, and then there's there's Donald Trump. It's like what? Like, it's like a weird cool? dream, yeah. <laughs> The real strange one, man. Like I haven't, I don't get invited to those kind of parties very often. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> probably because I talk about it too much. How weird it is! It's just like, don't bring that dude. He'll just run his mouth. That's right. That guy's not part of the club. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just want to kick him out. I always thought it'd be kind of funny, like for a professional singer to go and like hang out at like a karaoke club one night or something. Oh, dude, just those are the good times. Blows people's doing, minds. Yeah, I plan, I'm, I'm setting up a night right now at some point in time. Me and a couple, some of the students that I have, I teach vocal lessons to, and the older, the adult ones, of course. I tell yeah. them to do that. It's like, look, you got to go and just go to a karaoke boy joint where you don't know anybody in the part of town, yeah. but let's just go sing. So at some point in time, I'm going to do that. We, we've gotten into some karaoke like that after uh, we did, uh, it was Kelly Clarkson's tour. We finished the tour up with her and she had this whole karaoke thing set up for everybody in Nashville. Oh, wow. And man, that night is so blurry. I mean, I can remember like little bits and pieces of it. And our drummer at the time, Peter, he was a really reserved guy. He's a super tall, big old man. The dude's like six, six or something like that. Just a tall, very quiet, reserved, respectful human. But something happened that night where he just took over the mic and started singing all these Backstreet Boys wow. songs. <laughs> it was absolutely epic. It was like I couldn't ask for a tour to end on a better note. Watching Peter, like, sing these, like, Backstreet Boys songs. He's, like, got a nice shirt on, just ripping it, <laughs> taking all the leads and going for broke. It's like, dude, I didn't even know you sang like that. I would have put a microphone on you. <laughs> The whole time we've been touring, you never said once you could sing like that. He was killing it. Never it know amazing. what's going to happen, I guess, on karaoke nights. Yeah. Oh, dude, people will come out of their shells. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah I could imagine that it'd be pretty pretty irritating for you to go there, especially if you, like, sing your own song. Because then dude, that's, that's a ballsy move. That's really yeah. fun. That's like kind of the YouTube video that we make. That's yeah, pretty yeah cool, that's right. Dude. Just, just go like out there, it. yeah, dude. If we go and do that, I'm, I'm posting you up. I'm gonna keep sending you videos yeah, of us. That's doing right. It. Yeah, let me know. Let me know, and uh, I will. That that'd be funny because you'd be like afterwards, like, oh, by the way, I wrote this song too. So it's <laughs> just so you guys know, this is one of mine. <laughs> it's me, I sang that's this right. first. <laughs> So if you're if you're ever in Indianapolis, let me know. We can go to karaoke club there. That's it, dude. I'm into it. <laughs> I like that idea. That sounds very fun. I know that the last time I was there, man, we were in downtown near the university. Uh, okay. Uh, where the mall, there's a mall connected to a hotel. I remember that. There's like yeah, a really that's, nice hotel. Yeah, Circle Center Mall, I think. Yeah. That sounds right. And Graham Nash was staying there at the same time. And we were in the elevator with Graham. And like, I, like, I don't get starstruck anymore very much. But in that particular moment, it was just like, <laughs> we're in, we're here like in the middle of kind of we didn't we just got stuck we weren't playing anywhere we just were there like for some reason we got laid over yeah. and um that was the hotel the label put us up at and we were just totally choking up like yeah it's graham nash <laughs> but it was 
really surprising. It was a cool hotel. Like I want to come back and like kind of, I remember meeting a couple people in the hotel. There was a lady who was the receptionist at that restaurant and she just, they brought out such good food. Like they had some crazy like garlic French fries there that were, I can remember specifically how good these things were. And it, it was a cool walk all the way up to the university over there. And that like, there was a double story thing that you could walk into the mall. It was yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, no, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a fun place. Um, and yeah, next time I guess you're on tour or something like that, that'd be a cool place to check out. So. Dude, I'm in like next time we're there, let's karaoke it. Yeah, I'm sure. Real, I, mean, man. I love doing that kind of stuff. No, like, um, me, me and my brother do it a lot. When I'm back in Kansas, we go out to karaoke bar. <laughs> so. Where do you go when you're there? Like Power and Lights District? So you go to Power and Light. They have some stuff there. Um, there's a, a little bit more one near where we live. Um, mm -hmm. That's kind of like a, just a bar and grill, kind of a, a more family style place that's pretty chill. And you always, and a good thing about it is like you always have uh, time to go up. There's no like, there's not tons of people there. Oh, that's a nice one. And so you can go up there and do like three or four songs or something. Perfect. And so it's pretty, set. pretty chill. Exactly. You do a whole set and stuff. Like the, the Power Light one is uh, is nice and it's really fancy and stuff. But the problem is it's hard to get in to do a song. Like maybe you get one yeah. turn and then it's like, that's it. So Well, you get those professional karaoke guys who do like, they keep running like in the circuit. They'll do a circuit and they, yeah. like, compete. they make real yeah. money doing yeah i mean some of the people that go up there are like wow how are you not a professional singer because uh i've met a couple of guys like i've been given a few like just teaching a couple good singers how to breathe in a couple different ways just a little bit more kind of manufactured to help them do more yeah. nights like that. that was a problem because they were singing so many like these competitions they just needed to kind of get active in their the way that they approach singing but one singer one guy came through a couple of times he was making 10 grand every couple of weeks winning these karaoke oh contests like he was living a pretty rock star life like that's i was insane. like what are you up to he's like i live off of singing karaoke it's like that sounds suspect man is that just like a way for you to launder money or are you, are you feeling why you're out there doing that's karaoke right. what, yeah, <laughs> you know? that's, that's a unique job yeah <laughs> how do they pay you through venmo or bitcoin what is it you track your money <laughs> you that's know? crazy yeah no i mean yeah when i when yeah not not at that level, that's for sure. When I go out, so <laughs> I'm just yeah, like, no, dude, could be one of those moments. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my <laughs> my grandmother was a was an opera singer. Oh, um, dude, so you got it in you. But I don't I don't think I inherited that much talent. That's for sure. It's like she was she was singing at Juilliard, and then she performed oh at the Met God. in uh, New York what? City, and uh, yeah, oh, dude, so. that's cool. But so yeah, yeah she, that's all, then that's in you. I, I probably have a little bit, but I heard, I heard on the, my other side, my family, my grandfather was tone deaf. So, so oh, Stephen, then that's a perfect word. It's a rock world. Then you got yeah. the right, just enough to know and yeah. bad enough to give it something cool. <laughs> no. That's right. My own twist time. It's, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so thinking about like people who you know want to be a, a professional musician or something, what advice would you have based on your own experiences? Man, it's the advice for somebody who wants to like to do this world. Um, I, don't know. I think the most important thing is just make sure, like, live a, as, as humble as you can. <laughs> That's yeah. a good lesson. Like, keep it humble and just start to trust your instincts. Like, if you can, like, fight for your instincts, stay with them, like, stay with the stuff that you find that moves you. And just continue to work don't give up on it like just stay and and you know find one or two people that you can trust and share your music with or your art and if you really trust them and they'll, they'll tell you the truth you can use that as a way to get better and always yeah. like the best advice anybody ever gave me was like if you're the smartest person in the room you're in the wrong room so always go with people who are better than you like be humble enough to know that there are always going to be people who are better than you at what you do like your thing is probably very unique um and in that the fact that you got something unique that's yours nobody can touch that but if you're around what you consider to be better then that means you're going to grow like that if that person is a good person either not an abusive like overlord right. like yeah. if you can be around people who appreciate what your talent is but they still have what you consider to be something better they're gonna yeah. it's gonna force you to be a better thing and all that you do 
And if you can just stay humble in that way, that will get you so far. I mean, it's, it's been one of those things because I'm, I can willfully admit, like, I, because of the people that I was able to get in the rooms with by being humble, it changed my whole life. Like, just recognizing what my abilities are and listening to somebody be like, well, if you try this, it could be better. Just see it. Just be open-minded yeah. enough to try this. And I always would. I was like, okay, yeah, sure. Let's see what happens. <laughs> And nine times out of 10, their ideas were always better. And then occasionally I would get one that's just like, well, we do this and that works. But I keep those kind of convictions, like the ones I really believe in, I know that that's the right thing. But for the most part, always go with people that are better than you and, and surround yourself with that. That'll, that'll, you know, if you, if you have your art and you're holding on to what's yours, those people will respect you for that. And they'll like, they'll make your stuff better without even realizing they're doing it for you. Yeah. Literally. Like they're, they're doing your work. Yeah. That, that makes perfect <laughs> sense. Yeah. It's all about just trying to improve and yeah. Being around the yeah. right people. That's cool. That's the whole thing is like, kind of like, how do you keep evolving? And like, that's the most important thing. Like how, oh my God, how do the Rolling Stones still manage to make records? They just right. like, manage, you know, cause they'd still be making the same record from the fifties or sixties. if They didn't have somebody around to just kind of crack the whip and be like, no, these kids are doing something better than you guys right now. You should catch up with them. Yeah. They're doing it right. You know, and, and then they would bring like a good new young producer and be like, yeah, this is what kick drums sound like these days, guys. All right, try this. This is the new frequency. This is what the consoles are that they use. All right, that's the gig. Yeah, no, that makes that makes sense. That's cool. Um, so uh, let's see, just wrapping up, what are you yeah. working on right now? Man, right now I am, I'm working on that, that last Carolina Liar record. I've been pulling up tracks from that. And yeah. talking to a couple people about some new shows is a show that I have right now coming up in, in Reno and just trying oh, okay. to figure out how to turn that show into more of a, a bit of a charity show, like how we can do something that's, I want to make more of this stuff about uh, doing good work for people. Cause I'll ultimately, man, my life is pretty blessed. I mean, there've yeah. been struggles, but ultimately like I can make a pretty decent amount of money to cover what I need to. And then I can give the other part away. And I just don't, I'm, I'm terrible at organizing anything. So oh, okay. I got yeah. friends that are helping me put stuff like this together in the right way, like how to do this. And like, I can show up and make people like sing along and do that. But as far as like real structural organization, good God, you'd never, I would just yeah. somehow yeah. Know, I can make an atom bomb out of like something like that. And it would just explode. Right. Yeah. The idea for, for as far as work is right now is, I want to keep teaching people how to sing and play instruments and uh, just kind of get this next Carolina record out because it's a good yeah. one. Some really cool bits. That'd be pieces. cool. Yeah. I'm excited. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a wild life, man. It's like this, this show me just keeps getting more and more plays. It's like that thing just keeps on living. It's kind of the career that somehow magically just to keep going from that one song. It's rad. <laughs> Hey, yeah, that's right. Yeah, take what you can get. That's a that's a cool oh, thing. Yeah, dude, it's a gift. It really is. Like that whole thing is just like, all right, that bought me my freedom. Now that I can recognize it, I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. And how how can people keep in, keep track of what you're doing and stuff? How can they follow you? Yeah, the best thing is probably Instagram or Facebook. I'm kind of getting back into that. My social media text and stuff. I'm such an old person that I'm bad with it, but I'm getting better. I really yeah. <laughs> That's a but in, in, yeah. Instagram is probably the best one. I check in, in and out. I'm not the like most active. Um, right. It would be such a lie if I was on there every day and just being like, "Hey guys, look at uh, me! I'm yeah. really hip." I'm like, nah, I'll show up every now and then and just kind of start posting stuff up. And yeah. uh, that's a good one because that's that's real. That's actually I'm I'm on that page, just not that often. But yeah, right. hit me up, send me a DM, man. I'm always up for things. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Hey ben, thank you, man. This was fun.